the saffron morn, with early blushes spread, now rose refulgent from Tithonus' bed, with newborn day to gladden mortal sight, and gild the courts of heaven with sacred light. Then met the eternal synod of the sky, before the god who thunders from on high, supreme in might, sublime in majesty. Pallas to these deplores the unequal fates of wise Ulysses, and his toils relates. Her hero's danger touched the pitying power, the nymph's seducements, and the magic bower. Thus she began her plaint. Immortal Jove, and you who fill the blissful seats above, let kings no more with gentle mercy sway, or bless a people willing to obey, but crush the nations with an iron rod, and every monarch be the scourge of God, if from your thoughts Ulysses you remove, who ruled his subjects with a father's love, sole in an isle encircled by the main, abandoned, banished from his native reign, unblessed he sighs, detained by lawless charms, and pressed unwilling in Calypso's arms. Nor friends are there, nor vessels to convey, nor oars to cut the measurable way. And now fierce traitors, studious to destroy his only son, their ambushed fraud employ, who, pious, following his great father's fame, to sacred Pylos and to Sparta came. What words are these, replied the power who forms the clouds of night, and darkens heaven with storms? Is not already in thy soul decreed the chief's return shall make the guilty bleed? What cannot wisdom do? Thou mayst restore the son in safety to his native shore, while the fell foes who late in ambush lay with fraud defeated measure back their way. Then thus to Hermes the command was given, Hermes, thou chosen messenger of heaven, go to the nymph, be these our orders born. Tis Jove's decree Ulysses shall return. The patient man shall view his old abodes, nor help by mortal hand, nor guiding gods. In twice ten days shall Virtal Scaria fiend, alone and floating to the waves and wind, the bold Phaeacians there, whose haughty line is mixed with gods, half human, half divine. The chief shall honour as some heavenly guest, and swift transport him to his place of rest. His vessels loaded with a plenteous store of brass, of vestures, and resplendent ore, a richer prize than if his joyful isle received him charged with Ilion's noble spoil. His friends, his country, he shall see, though late. Such is our sovereign will, and such is fate. He spoke, the god who mounts the winged winds, fast to his feet the golden pinions bends, that high through fields of air his flight sustain, o'er the wide earth and o'er the boundless main. He grasps the wand that causes sleep to fly, or in soft slumber seals the wakeful eye, then shoots from heaven to high Pieria's steep, and stoops incumbent on the rolling deep. So watery fowl that seek their fishy food, with wings expanded o'er the foaming flood, now sailing smooth the level surface sweep, now dip their pinions in the briny deep. Thus o'er the world of waters Hermes flew, till now the distant island rose in view. Then swift descending from the azure wave, he took the path that winded to the cave. Large was that grot in which the nymph he found, the fair-haired nymph with every beauty crowned. She sat and sung, the rocks resound her lays, the cave was brightened with a rising blaze. Cedar and frankincense and odorous pile flamed on the hearth and wide perfumed the isle, while she with work and song the time divides as through the loom the golden shuttle guides. Without the grot a various sylvan scene appeared around, and groves of living green. Poplars and alders ever quivering played, and nodding cypress formed a fragrant shade. On whose high branches, waving with the storm, the birds of broadest wing their mansions form, the chuff, the sea mew, the loquacious crow, and scream aloft and skim the deeps below. Depending vines the shelving cavern screen, With purple clusters blushing through the green. Four limpid fountains from the clefts distill, And every fountain pours a several rill, In mazy windings wandering down the hill. Where bloomy meads with livid greens were crowned, And glowing violets threw odors round. A scene where, if a god should cast his sight, 
a god might gaze and wander with delight. Joy touched the messenger of heaven, he stayed entranced, and all the blissful haunts surveyed. Him entering in the cave Calypso knew, for power celestial to each other's view stand still confessed, though distant far they lie, to habitants of earth or sea or sky. But wide Ulysses, by himself apart, poured the big sorrows of his swelling heart. All on the lonely shore he sat to weep, and rolled his eyes around the restless deep. Toward his loved coast he rolled his eyes in vain, till dimmed with rising grief they streamed again. Now graceful seated on her shining throne, to Hermes thus the nymph divine begone. God of the golden wand, on what behest arrivest thou here, an unexpected guest? Loved as thou art, thy free injunctions lay, tis mine with joy and duty to obey. Till now a stranger in a happy hour approach, and taste the dainties of my bower. Thus having spoke, the nymph the table spread, ambrosial cakes with nectar rosy red. Hermes the hospitable rite partook, divine reflection, then recruited spoke. What moves this journey from my native sky, a goddess asks, nor can a god deny. Hear then the truth, by mighty Jove's command, unwilling I have trod this pleasant land. For who, self-move with weary wing, would sweep such length of ocean and unmeasured deep, a world of waters, far from all the ways where men frequent, or sacred altars blaze? But to Jove's will submission we must pay. What power so great to dare to disobey? A man, he says, a man resides with thee, of all his kind most worn with misery. The Greeks, whose arms for nine long year employed their voice on Ilion, in the tenth destroyed, at length embarking in a luckless hour, with conquest proud incensed Minerva's power. Hence on the guilty race her vengeance hurled, with storms pursued them through the liquid world. There all his vessels sunk beneath the wave, there all his dear companions found their grave. Saved from the jaws of death by heaven's decree, the tempest drove him to these shores and thee. Him Jove now orders to his native lands, straight to dismiss, so destiny commands. Impatient fate his near return attends, and calls him to his country and his friends. Into her inmost soul the goddess shook, then thus her anguish and her passion broke. Gracious gods, with spite and envy cursed, still to your own ethereal race the worst, he envy mortal and, and immortal joy, and love the only sweet of life destroy. Did ever goddess by her charms engage a favoured mortal and not feel your rage? So when Aurora sought Orion's love, her joys disturbed your blissful hours above, till in Ortigia Dian's winged dart had pierced the hapless hunter to the heart. So when the covert of the thrice eared fields saw stately Ceres to her passion yield, scarce could Iasian taste her heavenly charms, but Jove's swift lightning scorched him in her arms. And is it now my turn, ye mighty powers? Am I the envy of your blissful bowers? A man, an outcast to the storm and wave, it was my crime to pity and to save. Then he who thunders rent his bark in twain, and sunk the brave companions in the main. Alone, abandoned, in mid-ocean tossed, the sport of winds, and driven from every coast. Hither this man of miseries I led, received the friendless and the hungry fed. Nay, promised, vainly promised, to bestow immortal life exempt from age and woe. "'Tis past, and Jove decrees he must remove. "'Gods as we are, we are but slaves to Jove. "'Go then, he must, he must, if you ordain, "'try all those dangers, all those deeps again. "'But never, never shall Calypso send "'to toils like these her husband and her friend. "'What ships have I, what sailors to convey, "'what oars to cut the long laborious way? "'Yet I'll direct the safest means to go.' That last advice is all I can bestow. To her the power who hears the charming rod. Dismiss the man, nor irritate the god. Prevent the rage of him who reigns above. For what so dreadful as the wrath of Jove? Thus having said, he cut the cleaving sky, and in a moment vanished from her eye. 
the nymph obedient to divine command, to seek Ulysses, paced along the sand, him pensive on the lonely beach she found, with streaming eyes in briny torrents drowned, and inly pining for his native shore, for now the soft enchantress pleased no more. For now, reluctant and constrained by charms, absent he lay in her desiring arms, in slumber wore the heavy night away, on rocks and shores consumed the tedious day, there sat all desolate and sighed alone, with echoing sorrows made the mountains groan, and rolled his eyes o'er all the restless main, till dimmed with rising grief they streamed again. Here on his musing mood the goddess pressed, approaching soft, and thus the chief addressed, Unhappy man, to wasting woes a prey, no more in sorrows languish life away. Free as the winds I give thee now to rove, go fell the timber of yon lofty grove, and form a raft, and build the rising ship, sublime to bear thee o'er the gloomy deep. To store the vessel let the care be mine, with water from the rock and rosy wine, and life-sustaining bread and fair array, and prosperous gales to waft thee on thy way. These, if the gods with my desire comply, the gods, alas, more mighty far than I, and better skilled in dark events to come, in peace shall land thee at thy native home. With sighs Ulysses heard the words she spoke, then thus his melancholy silence broke. Some other motive, goddess, sways thy mind, some close design or turn of womankind, nor my return the end, nor this the way, on a slight raft to pass the swelling sea. Huge, horrid, vast, where scarce in safety sails the best-built ship, though Jove inspires the gales. The bold proposal, how shall I fulfill, dark as I am unconscious of thy will? Swear, then, thou meanst not what my soul forebodes. Swear by the solemn oath that binds the gods. Him while he spoke, with smiles Calypso eyed, and gently grasped his hand, and thus replied, This shows thee, friend, by old experience taught, and learned in all the wiles of human thought, how prone to doubt, how cautious are the wise. But hear, O earth, and hear, ye sacred skies, and thou, O Styx, whose formidable floods glide through the shades and bind the testing gods. No form design, no meditated end lurks in the counsel of thy faithful friend. Kind the persuasion and sincere my aim, the same my practice were my fate the same. Heaven has not cursed me with a heart of steel, but given the sense to pity and to feel. Thus having said, the goddess marched before, and trod her footsteps in the sandy shore. At the cool cave arrived, they took their state. He filled the throne where Mercury had sat. For him the nymph a rich repast ordains, such as the mortal life of man sustains. Before herself were placed the cakes divine, ambrosial banquet and celestial wine. Their hunger satiate and their thirst repressed, thus spoke Calypso to her godlike guest. Ulysses, with a sigh, she thus began, O oh, sprung from gods, in wisdom more than man, is then thy home the passion of thy heart? Thus wilt thou leave me? Are we thus to part? Farewell, and ever joyful mayst thou be, nor break the transport with one thought of me. But, ah, Ulysses, wert thou given to know what fate yet deems thee still to undergo. Thy heart might settle in this scene of ease, and e'en these slighted charms might learn to please. A willing goddess, an immortal life, might banish from thy mind an absent wife. Am I inferior to mortal dame? Less soft my feature, less august my frame, or shall the daughters of mankind compare their earth-born beauties with the heavenly fair? Alas, for this, the prudent man replies, against Ulysses shall thy anger rise. Loved and adored, O goddess as thou art, forgive the weakness of a human heart, though well I see thy graces far above, the dear though mortal object of my love. Of youth eternal well the difference know, and the short date of fading charms below. Yet every day, while absent thus I roam, I languish to return and die at home. Whate'er the gods shall destine me to bear, in the black ocean or the watery ware, 
Tis mine to master with a constant mind, inured to perils, to the worst resigned, by seas, by wars, so many dangers run, still I can suffer, there high will be done. Thus while he spoke, the beamy sun descends, and rising night her friendly shade extends. To the close grot the lonely pair remove, and slept delighted with the gifts of love. When rosy morning called them from their rest, Ulysses robed him in the cloak and vest, the nymph's fair head a veil transparent graced, her swelling loins a radiant zone embraced, with flowers of gold, an under robe unbound, in snowy waves flowed glittering on the ground. Forth issuing thus, she gave him first to wield a weighty axe with truest temper steeled, and double-edged, the handle smooth and plain, wrought of the clouded olive's easy grain. And next a wedge to drive with sweepy sway, then to the neighboring forest led the way. On the lone island's utmost verge there stood, of poplars, pine, and firs, a lofty wood, whose leafless summits to the skies aspire, scorched by the sun, or seared by heavenly fire, already dried. These pointing out to view, the nymph just showed him, and with tears withdrew. Now toils the hero. Trees on trees or thrown fall crackling round him, and the forest groan. Sudden full twenty on the plain are strode, and lopped and lightened of their branchy load. At equal angles these disposed to jine, he smoothed and squared them by the rule and line. The wimbles for the work Calypso found, with those he pierced them, and with clinchers bound. Long and capacious as a shipwright forms some bark's broad bottom to outride the storms, so large he built the raft, then ribbed it strong from space to space, and nailed the planks along. These formed the sides, the deck he fashioned last, then o'er the vessel raised the taper mast, with crossing sail yards dancing in the wind, and to the helm the guiding rudder jined. With yielding osiers fenced to break the force of surging waves and steer the steady course. Thy loom, Calypso, for the future sails supplied the cloth capacious of the gales. With stays and cordage last he rigged the ship, and rolled on levers launched her on the deep. Four days were past, and now the work complete, shone the fifth morn, when from her sacred seat the nymph dismissed him, odorous garments given, and bathed in fragrant oils that breathed of heaven. Then filled two goat skins with her hands divine, with water one, and one with sable wine, of every kind, provisions heaved aboard, and the full decks with copious viands stored. The goddess last a gentle breeze supplies to curl old ocean and to warm the skies. And now, rejoicing in the prosperous gales, with beating heart Ulysses spreads his sails, placed at the helm he sat and marked the skies, nor closed in sleep his ever-watchful eyes. There viewed the Pleiads and the northern team, and great Orion's more refulgent beam, to which around the axle of the sky the bear revolving points his golden eye, who shines exalted on the ethereal plain, nor bathes his blazing forehead in the main. Far on the left those radiant fires to keep the nymph directed as he sailed the deep. Full seventeen nights he cut the foaming way, the distant land appeared the following day, then swelled to sight Phaeacia's dusky coast, and woody mountains half in vapours lost, that lay before him indistinct and vast, like a broad shield amid the watery wast. But him thus voyaging the deeps below, from far on Solomy's aerial bro, the king of ocean saw, and seeing burned, from Ethiopia's happy climes returned, the raging monarch shook his azure head, and thus in secret to his soul he said, Heavens, how uncertain are the powers on high! Is then reversed the sentence of the sky? In one man's favor, while a distant guest I shared, secure the Ethiopian's fist? Behold how near Phaeacia's land he draws, the land affixed by fate's eternal laws to end his toils. Is then our anger vain? No, if this scepter yet commands the main. He spoke, and high the fork he trident hurled, rolls clouds on clouds, and stirs the watery world. At once the face of earth and sea deforms, 
swells all the winds and rouses all the storms. Down rush the night, east, west together roar, and south and north roll mountains to the shore. Then shook the hero, to despair resigned, and questioned thus his yet unconquered mind. Wretch that I am, what farther fates attend this life of toils, and what my destined end? Too well, alas, the island goddess knew, on the black sea what perils should ensue. New horrors now this destined head enclose, until is yet the measure of my woes. With what a cloud the brows of heaven are crowned, with raging winds what roaring waters round. Tis Jove himself this swelling tempest rears, death, present death on every side appears. Happy, thrice happy he, when battle slain, pressed in Atreides' cause the Trojan plain. Oh, had I died before that well-fought wall, had some distinguished day renowned my fall, such as was that when showers of javelins fled from conquering Troy around Achilles dead. All Greece had paid me solemn funerals then, and spread my glory with the sons of men. A shameful fate now hides my hapless head, unwept, unnoted, and forever dead. A mighty wave rushed o'er him as he spoke. The raft is covered, and the mast is broke. Swept from the deck and from the rudder torn, far on the swelling surge the chief was borne. While by the howling tempest rent in twain flew sail and sail yards rattling o'er the main. Long pressed he heaved beneath the weighty wave, clogged by the cumbrous vest Calypso gave. At length emerging from his nostrils wide, and gushing mouth effused the briny tide. E'en then not mindless of his last retreat, he seized the raft, and leaped into his seat. Strong with the fear of death, in rolling flood, now here, now there, impelled the floating wood, as when a heap of gathered thorns is cast, now to, now fro, before the tumnal blast, together clung it rolls around the field. So rolled the float, and so its texture held. And now the south, and now the north bear sway, and now the east the foamy floods obey, and now the west wind whirls it o'er the say. The wandering chief, with toils on toils oppressed, Leucothea saw, and pity touched her breast, herself a mortal once of Cadmus' strain, but now an azure sister of the main. Swift as a sea-mew springing from the flood, all radiant on the raft the goddess stood, and thus addressed him, Thou whom heaven decrees to Neptune's wrath, stern tyrant of the seas, unequalled contest, not his rage and power, great as he is, such virtue shall devour. What I suggest thy wisdom will perform. Forsake thy float and leave it to the storm. Strip off thy garments, Neptune's fury brave, with naked strength and plunge into the wave. To reach Phaeacia all thy nerves extend, where fate decrees thy miseries shall end. This heavenly scarf beneath thy bosom bind, and live, give all thy terrors to the wind. Soon as thy arms the happy store shall gain, return the gift and cast it in the main. Observe my orders, and with heed obey. Cast it far off, and turn thy eyes away. With that her hand the sacred veil bestows. Then down the deeps she died from whence she rose. A moment snatched the shining form away, and all was covered with the curling say. Struck with amaze, yet still to doubt inclined, he stands suspended, and explores his mind. What shall I do? Unhappy me, who knows? But other gods intend me other woes. Whoe'er's thou art, I shall not blindly jine thy pleaded reason, but consult with mine. For scarce in ken appears that distant isle. Thy voice foretells me shall conclude my tile. Thus then I judge, while yet the planks sustain the wild wave's fury, here I fixed remain. But when their texture to the tempest yields, I launch adventurous on the liquid fields. Join to the help of gods the strength of man, and take this method since the best I can. While thus his thoughts and anxious counsel hold, the raging god a watery mountain rolled. Like a black sheet the whelming billows spread, burst o'er the float and thundered on his head. Planks, beams, disparted fly, the scattered wood rolls diverse and in fragments strews the flood. So the rude Boreas, o'er the field new-shorn, tosses and drives the scattered heaps of corn. And now a single beam the chief bestrides, 
there poised a while above the bounding tides, his limbs discumbers of the clinging vest, and binds the sacred kinkshire round his breast. Then prone an ocean in a moment flung, stretched wide his eager arms, and shot the seas along. All naked now on heaving billows laid, stern Neptune eyed him, and contemptuous said, Go learned in woes, and other foes essay, Go wander helpless on the watery way, Thus, thus find out the destined shore, And then, if Jove ordains it, mix with happier men. Whate'er thy fate, the ills our wrath could raise, Shall last remembered in thy best of days. This said, his sea-gurn steeds divide the foam, and reach high Eji and the towery dome. Now scarce withdrawn the fierce earth-shaking power, Jove's daughter Pallas watched the favoring hour. Back to their caves she bade the winds to fly, and hushed the blustering brethren of the sky. The drier blasts alone a boreous sway, and bear him soft on broken waves away, with gentle force impelling to that shore where fate has destined he shall toil no more, and now two nights and now two days were past since wide he wandered on the watery west, heaved on the surge with intermitting breath, and hourly panting in the arms of death, the third fair morn now blazed upon the main, then glassy smooth lay all the liquid plain. The winds were hushed, the billows scarcely curled, and a dead silence stilled the watery world. When lifted on a ridgy wave, he spies the land at distance, and with sharpened eyes, as pious children joy with vast delight, when a loved sire revives before their sight, who, lingering along, has called on death in vain, fixed by some demon to his bed of pain, till heaven by miracle his life restore, so joys Ulysses at the peering shore and sees and labors onward as he sees the rising forests and the tufted trees. And now, as near approaching as the sound of human voice the listening ear may wound, amidst the rocks he heard a hollow roar of murmuring surges breaking on the shore. Nor peaceful port was there, nor winding bay to shield the vessel from the rolling say. But cliffs and craggy shores, a dreadful sight, all rough with rocks and foamy billows white. Fear seized his slackened limbs and beating heart, and thus he communed with his soul apart. Ah me, when o'er a length of waters tossed, these eyes at last behold the unhoped-for coast. No port receives me from the angry main, but the loud deeps demand me back again. Above, sharp rocks forbid access, around roar the wild waves, beneath is sea profound. No footing sure affords the faithless sand, to stem too rapid and too deep to stand. If here I enter, my efforts are vain, dashed on the cliffs or heaved into the main, or round the island in my course I bend, where the ports open or the shores descend, back to the seas the rolling surge may sweep, and bury all my hopes beneath the deep or some enormous wail the god may send, for many such an amphitrite attend. Too well the turns of mortal chance I know, and hate relentless of my heavenly foe. While thus he thought, a monstrous wave upbore the chief, and dashed him on the craggy shore. Torn was his skin, nor had the ribs been whole, but instant Pallas entered in his soul. Close to the cliff with both his hands he clung, and stuck adherent, and suspended hung till the huge surge rolled off, then backward sweep the refluent tides and plunge him in the deep. As when the polypus from forth his cave, torn with full force, reluctant beats the wave, his ragged claws are stuck with stones and sands, so the rough rock had shagged Ulysses' hands, and now had perished, whelmed beneath the main, the happy man, e'en fate had been in vain, but all subduing Pallas lent her power, and prudence saved him in the needful hour. Beyond the beating surge his course he bore, a wider circle, but in sight of shore, with longing eyes observing to survey some smooth ascent or safe sequestered bay. Between the parting rocks at length he spied a failing stream with gentler waters glide, where to the seas the shelving shore declined and formed a bay impervious to the wind. To this calm port the glad Ulysses pressed, and hailed the river, and its god addressed. Whoe'er thou art, before whose stream unknown I bend, a suppliant at thy watery throne, 
Hear as your king, nor let me fly in vain to thee from Neptune and the raging main. Heaven hears and pities hapless men like me, for sacred even to gods is misery. Then let thy waters give the weary rest, and save a suppliant and a man distressed. He prayed, and straight the gentle stream subsides, detains the rushing current of his tides, before the wanderer smooths the watery way, and soft receives him from the rolling say. That moment, fainting as he touched the shore, he dropped his sinewy arms, his knees no more performed their office, or his weight upheld. His swollen heart heaved, his bloated body swelled, from mouth and nose the briny torrent ran, and lost in lassitude lay all the man. Deprived of voice, of motion, and of breath, the soul scarce waking in the arms of death. Soon as warm life its wonted office found, the mindful chief Leucothea's scarf unbound. Observant of her word, he turned aside his head and cast it on the rolling tide. Behind him, far upon the purple waves, the waters waft it, and the nymph receives. Now parting from the stream Ulysses found a mossy bank with pliant rushes crowned. The bank he pressed and gently kissed the ground. Where on the flowering herb as soft he lay, thus to his soul the sage began to say, What will ye next ordain, ye powers on high? And yet, ah, yet, what fates are we to try? Here by the stream, if I the night outwear, thus spent already, how shall nature bear the dews descending and nocturnal air? or chilly vapours breathing from the flood, when morning rises, if I take the wood, and in thick shelter of innumerous boughs enjoy the comfort gentle sleep allows. Though fenced from cold, and though my toil be past, what savage beasts may wander in the west? Perhaps I yet may fall a bloody prey to prowling bears or lions in the way. Thus long debating in himself he stood. At length he took the passage to the wood, whose shady horrors on a rising bro waved high and frowned upon the stream below. There grew two olives closest of the grove, with roots entwined and branches interwove. Alike their leaves, but not alike they smiled with sister fruits, one fertile, one was wild. Nor here the sun's meridian rays had power, nor wind sharp piercing, nor the rushing shower. The verdant arch so close its texture kept, Beneath this covert great Ulysses crept. Of gathered leaves an ample bed he made, Thick strewn by tempest through the bowery shade, Where three at least might winter's cold defy, Though Boreas raged along the inclement sky. This store with joy the patient hero found, And, sunk amidst them, heaped the leaves around. As some poor peasant fated to reside, Remote from neighbours in a forest wide, Studious to save what human wants require, In embers heap preserves the seeds of fire. Hid in dry foliage, thus Ulysses lies, Till Pallas poured soft slumbers on his eyes, And golden dreams, the gift of sweet repose, Lulled all his cares, and banished all his woes.